uh, as you all know, this is a, uh, a um, panel that is going to be talking about user-generated content. And I'm just here to time people. <laughs> so uh, without any kind of ado, uh, why don't we first hear Elisabetta Ferrari and critical analyses of user-generated content. <laughs> Good morning. Um, thank you. Um, now, what I'm going to do in my talk is actually I'm going to focus on a very small section of what we can consider user-generated content. And as you probably can already imagine, there is a contested definition of what user-generated content might actually mean. So I'm going to cut it cut it short and I'll focus on one particular aspect, which is how social networking sites, commercial ones like Facebook and Twitter, actually have captured, formalized, and institutionalized user-generated content. And I'm sure that in the panel we'll have uh, more time and we'll have a more complete picture of what user-generated content can mean and how it can be empowering and fun and great, as you probably all experience in your daily life. Um, but I would, what I would like to contribute to this discussion is that we need to think about the way in which user-generated content has been captured and shaped by commercial social media platforms. Platforms. And to think that that is actually really problematic, both from the point of view of individuals and from the point of view of collectives, and especially from the point of view of collectives that intend to use these technologies for political ends. Um, and this is pretty much a work in progress, and it's a collection of thoughts that I've had doing different strange, strains of research. So I'm going to throw in more questions that I can actually answer, and I'm happy to take them on in, in the Q&A. Um, so the first way in which commercial social media platforms have captured user-generated content is that they have transformed it into a way of making profit. Um, these platforms, Facebook, Twitter, they provide users with the technology and the audience to express themselves. Um, and this, these free and rewarding instances of self-expression that we do in our everyday life are actually a form of unrewarded, unpaid, free digital labor. Um, and it is this digital labor that drives the social media platforms. Granted, of course, there's another big source of revenue for these platforms, and that's surveillance, that's advertising, that's selling our personal information. Um, but these social media would not exist without digital labor. Without the creativity of, their, of individuals that are on these platforms, these sites would not attract anyone. Um, without the free labor of users, social media would have no one's data to sell because no one would be there in the first place. Um, Yes. So the crucial mechanism that is employed by a commercial social media platform is to essentially transform leisure into labor. And they're doing it great. <laughs> they're doing it marvelously. Um, because honestly, putting your effort into producing something for free uh, that ends up profiting a gigantic corporation has never been so pleasurable as it is when we are on Facebook and we're clicking and linking and sharing. Um, and this is where I think that a lot of the scholarship that works on digital labor and immaterial labor actually has it wrong. because they are not able to account for the fact that we enjoy being on social media, that we like doing this, that we are rewarded in ways that are intangible and that ultimately points us to, the, to doing this all the time. But the second way in which social networking sites actually capture user-generated content is that they frame it as an individual-centric activity. Now, of course, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you as a user interact with other individuals. But the starting point is always the one profile, the personal profile with a username or with your real name, a, pa a, a profile that is guarded by a password. And although this might seem not that much problematic from the point of view of individuals, um, it's actually very challenging if we approach it from the point of view of collectives and of collective organizations. Uh, movements, parties, activist groups, they all almost feel obliged to be on social media because they think that this is where they can reach uh, a broader, wider public. Uh, but being a collective entity and working with social media is not easy, and I have discovered this in doing my research on Occupy groups, and especially on the Occupy group in the city of Chicago. Um, now, what I found in my research is that um, Occupy groups all over the country have tried to deal with some of the critical aspects of social media that they don't like. Um, some less effectively than others. Um, Occupy Chicago is a very, very funny quote, which is essentially, we can do anything about these technologies, so just make a fake profile, get involved, and then forget about it. Uh, now, there have been other attempts to sort of do this a little more effectively. 
But all of these groups have encountered significant difficulties in using social media in a way that was participatory and inclusive for everyone, that made sense for a collective involved in doing protests. And these difficulties range from having different groups in movements open competing Twitter and Facebook accounts because they couldn't agree on what content should be put on these accounts. Um, you have activists suing each other in court over the control of these social network accounts. Um, and then you have the creation of online uh, sorry, offline political groups dedicated to saying that, no, we don't agree with social media. So responses have varied. Uh, but what I would like to point out is that um, it would be naive, um, as many have done, to actually think that this happens because activists are not that good at using these technologies. It's not a problem of technological competence. It's a political problem, and there's probably something, something there, something that we haven't explored yet. And um, what I'd like to suggest is that what we haven't explored yet is how social networking sites have captured user-generated content and how this is changing the way in which a variety of actors think about participation. Um, and although user-generated content, social media are innovation that might open up the possibility for many more people um, to participate, people that have never participated before, we should also think critically of what this participation really means. Um, because the underlying logic of social media platforms is a vision of social life as an individualized and fragmented experience, um, where pre-existing interests find a space where they can be connected. So by design, this is not a collective space. It's a space in which individuals are aggregated in ways that are not always transparent, that are certainly not in the control of the individual users. Um, Occupy protesters have found it very, very difficult to change the structures of inequality and corporate power that exist in this country and in the world. Uh, but they have also discovered that it's difficult to change the structures that make social media work in the way they do. This is not a possibility that has been in the hands of social, of social movements. Um, and perhaps this is not a coincidence. Um, and we should be talking about this. We should be talking about how social networking sites and user-generated content really work. And we need to open a debate that goes beyond clicktivism and slacktivism and actually take on the real matter at stake, which is how these technologies are changing, if they are, the way in which we think about participation and political participation in particular. Um, Again, if we want to understand what user-generated content and social media really mean for us as citizens, we should be asking what participation <coughs> really means. Uh, we should be asking what participation really means if we, cannot, if we cannot put under scrutiny and ultimately change the structures in which our participation is embedded. Thank you. Is it, is it the same PowerPoint? Oh. It's, on the, actually, it's on the desktop. The oh. next person. <laughs> is Kevin Gotkin, who has better brains. Cosmetic neurology on YouTube. You have better brains on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, okay. It's actually just behind this presentation. Oh, okay. Is it mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Yep. All right, cool. All right. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Katarina, for organizing this panel, and thanks to Park for, um, you know, hosting us. Um, so I want to start with the caveat that this presentation is super, super, super preliminary work, and I'm excited to start talking about it, but I am not really going to get into the heart of, like, researching and writing about it until the new year. So um, with that said, I want to start with um, a YouTube video. Okay, cool. To share that because on the, you know, this happening on the back of my last experiment, which was me in search of uh, mood enhancement nootropics, I think this is really significant. Um, I know that there are other areas of the brain that people who use TDCS to treat depression uh, stimulate, uh, and this isn't it. But maybe not necessarily for depression um, treatment, but perhaps for people who are interested in uh, meditating or who do meditate or hell, just, just need a way to relax before bed, I have to endorse this particular montage uh, because this is a great feeling. I mean, uh, and it is affecting my mood. Uh, so that, that definitely tells me uh, that there might be some implications there too. Um, but I'm not a physician or a psychiatrist, so I'm not giving anybody advice. I'm just saying for those of you who do engage in TDCS, um, whether it be for mood regulation or, you know, for other purposes, this particular montage uh, has a very unique capability of providing this feeling, and it's really cool. Um, thank you all for tuning in, and uh, be well and do good things. 
In this video, a man is seated facing his camera with a number of thin black straps around the top of his head. Above and behind one of his ears, there is a small box. This is where one of two electrodes is pressed against his head. The man is talking about his search for a mild euphoric effect, one in a series of what he calls experiments that he documents in his YouTube videos. He is one of many in a dedicated group of YouTubers who are using made-at-home devices for neurostimulation to enhance cognitive mood and ability. Transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS, is an increasingly popular at-home method for jerry-rigging devices for brain enhancement. In recent years, it has been covered in popular media outlets as a groundbreaking medical and extra-medical set of practices. And you get a sense of this hype when you hear about how it works. TDCS is a process of sending constant, low, direct current through electrodes attached uh, uh, to the head. This increases intracerebral uh, current flow, which uh, changes neuronal excitability in the brain that is being, the brain areas that are being targeted, and this excitability in turn affects brain function. So in other words, adding electrical current directly to the brain through skin on the skull has been shown to enhance different brain activities depending on the cortical region that is stimulated. Originally developed as a therapy, therapy for people with brain injuries and other mental disabilities, TDCS has in recent years captured an amateur imagination about how inexpensive and widely available devices might help us harness untapped cognitive resources. Let me give just the briefest tour of some of the evidence for TDCS's effects, and then I'll get, uh, get to finally get to why I'm interested in it. So TDCS has been shown to produce significant effects in and get ready because I can't really like, get into detail on all the studies, but it has been shown <laughs> to produce effects in language abilities, including faster naming, name recognition, grammar acquisition, verbal fluency, reading skill, motor learning, numerical competence, visuospatial processing, creativity, causal reasoning, <laughs> insight, social cognition, including susceptibility to deception, a whole host of effects alleviating mood and anxiety disorders, and perhaps most interesting of them all with research being done right here at Penn, TDCS has been shown to elicit experiences of self-transcendence similar to those to the effects of deep meditation. Now the research that corroborates these findings has happened in traditional sites of medical practice, university labs, FDA trials, et cetera, and I have recently gained access to the lab here at Penn that does this work. It's called the Lab for Cognition and Neural Stimulation, led by Dr. Roy Hamilton. Uh, but TDCS research that happens in conventional lab and clinic settings is actually not what interests me here. I'm interested in this kind of uh, non-invasive neurostimulation that some have taken to calling cosmetic neurology because it happens on a user's own terms, driven by desire for enhancement with applications that are impromptu or unregimented. And I'm particularly interested in how YouTube acts as a digital archive for a group of users and viewers who are actively experimenting with, supplying information about, and testing their own devices. So I'm just going to give two ways that I'm starting to think about these videos. Uh, in his well-cited book, Risk Society, Ulrich Beck claims that medicine is what he calls an extreme case in a new political culture. He writes that if we were to treat medicine as an official politics, it would be, quote, equivalent to the scandal of simply implementing epoch-making fundamental decisions on the social future while bypassing the parliament and the public sphere. He continues, according to medicine's social structure, there is no parliament in the sub-politics of medicine and no executive branch where the consequences of the decision could be investigated in advance. There is not even a social locus of decision making and thus ultimately no firm decision and none that could be made firm. Beck sees as, a fun, as fundamental to medical knowledge a disequilibrium between the public debate and discourse about medicine and the internal decision making power of medical practice. I wonder then to what extent amateur medical knowledge might affect this imbalance in medical governance, either by falling into line with a certain mode of experimentation and report that has characterized the scientization of medicine since the, the mid 19th century, or whether more provocatively, these YouTubers might represent a way out of what Beck characterizes as the impermeable sub-political character of medicine. Drawing on some historical research I've done myself on um, amateur technical expertise, I want to ask if a certain amateur spirit we witness in these videos has the capacity to puncture otherwise closed off domains of medical knowledge production. So that's one question that I have about these video videos. The other um, is about new forms of subjectivity that emerge from having the capacity to cosmetically alter your brain function. 
Here I am inspired, I'm inspired by Beatrice Preciado's book, Testo Junkie, which can be read as a reformulation of Foucault's history of sexuality for a digital age, where neoliberal biopolitics are now endemic to our media structures, what she calls porn power, and our medical apparatus, what he calls pharmacopower. Within the increasing, increasingly liquid and intoxicating structures that, uh, of desire that determine our daily relations, Preciado proposes a set of auto-experimentation practices that were once central to the research of Freud and Benjamin. As Pre Preciado notes, Freud and Benjamin formed the fundamentals of their research practices in a complicated psychotropic milieu that included addiction to cocaine which was an attempt to find a, a universal therapy that transcends individual intoxication by poisoning oneself to hold forth about the real. This is partly how Preciado arrives at the imploration for us to experiment on ourselves when collective routes to emancipa emancipation are foreclosed. Preciado writes, pharmacopornographic emancipation of subaltern bodies can be measured only according to these essential criteria, involvement in and access to the production, circulation, and interpretation of somatopolitic biocodes. Said another way, we must recode biopolitics from the inside, using our bodies as sites for experimentation. I wonder then whether we can find radical potential in cosmetic neurology, where users are not just adding more current to their cerebral pathways, but also altering how they think and how they think about how they think. Neurostimulation scientists, the folks in the labs, are quick to point out that the ethics and morality of, ch of changing cognitive ability through TDCS are challenging, but what if they're also revolutionary? In drawing an analogy between drug use and TDCS, I hope to signal a way of thinking about technology and the self in larger circuits connected to systems of desire, care, and media beyond what usually comes to mind when we use the word minds and technologies. So I have like more thoughts on that, but I'll just stop there. I know, I, I, didn't, I didn't fill the time. <laughs> Now, Yoel Roth, the selfie police, content management and its discontents, question mark. <laughs> People always seem to add question marks to the end of my talk titles. This is one of the rare. I mean, it's fine, actually. I'm perfectly happy to pose it as a question. Um, so this is work that some of you at least have heard bits and pieces of um, over the years that I've been here at Annenberg, but today I want to sort of try to frame it a little bit more broadly and also use it as a way to think about the theme of today's panel, which is user-generated content. And so before I get started, I want to put out the phrase people-generated content as something that we might entertain as an alternative, and I'll try to elaborate on that a little bit, but this is the, the sort of sketchy part of the talk. Um, I want to get started with a figure that many of us became familiar with last month, which is Kim Kardashian and her ass and her attempt to, in her own terms, hashtag break the internet. Um, now, Kim Kardashian's ass has been the subject of a lot of critical examination, much of which has taken place here at Annenberg and which is extremely valuable, which unfortunately I don't have time to get into right now. Um, but instead, I want to, to turn to the question that was posed really provocatively and hard-hittingly by the Washington Post, which was, why is Kim Kardashian allowed to be naked on Instagram, but Chelsea Handler is not? This is uh, one of our finest journalistic institutions. <laughs> now, for those of you who might not be familiar with the controversy, uh, Chelsea Handler is a comedian who's had some run-ins with Instagram in the past. Specifically, she's posted images on the, on the service, which is owned by Facebook, uh, that have showed her with exposed breasts. And in response, Instagram has consistently removed her content from the platform. Now, Ms. Handler's been understandably quite upset about this, particularly in the face of things like Kim Kardashian's Break the Internet campaign, and has asked, why is Kim allowed to be naked on the internet, but I'm not? Now, these kinds of issues, which I'm going to be talking about throughout the talk, aren't just restricted to topless and, in Kim's case, bottomless celebrities. Uh, this summer, the San Francisco Chronicle showed us a picture of a really cute baby and asked, is this baby too racy for Instagram? The newspaper then continued on to suggest that photos of breastfeeding mothers have given birth to a series of mommy wars on the platform. 
suggesting that, in fact, users are, in, are embroiled in a battle amongst themselves about what's appropriate to show or not show on these platforms. I think it's a sort of interesting framing of events that rather than asking why we find a photo of a baby threatening, we're instead consistently framing this as an argument amongst users about what is or isn't allowable. Uh, a number of other blogs and uh, individuals have run into issues like this in the past. In October, the massively popular blog Boing Boing, for example, uh, ran into a problem when they posted a photo of Salvador Dali with three nude women. The blog then took to its Twitter page, posting, fuck Facebook, it's Salvador Dali making iconic art 50 years ago, you morons, which, you know, fair enough. Um, other users have likened Facebook and their content management policies to a police state and have questioned why we're willing to accept these kinds of draconian rules about showing boobs or butts on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms. In each of these cases, I would argue that we're seeing instances of what I call illegitimate content management, rules that either are applied unequally, as was the case with Kim and Chelsea Handler, or rules that don't make sense to us at all. Why might breastfeeding be allowed in certain situations but not others? Why butts but not boobs? Why male nipples but not female ones? That one's a particularly frequent source of contention here. And these rules don't really lend themselves to being, you know, understood by users of platforms. Facebook's community standards offer these sort of very broad principled statements about what is or isn't allowed, addressing everything from violence and threats to self-harm to bullying and harassment to more specific guidelines about things like nudity or impersonation. Their, their policy statement about pornography is an especially interesting combination of very particular examples like how breastfeeding is allowed and then these sort of normative statements, like how they aspire to respect people's right to share content of personal importance. Unfortunately for their users, they don't really provide any kind of elaboration about what personal importance means or where they draw the line between good and bad in terms of uh, permissive content. The rules on Twitter-owned video sharing service Vine are equally complicated. The service has a, about a dozen content boundaries and rules for the use of Vine of which three engage specifically, although not clearly, with the questions of nudity and objectionable content. There's a sensitive media policy, an explicit graphic content policy, a pornography and sexually explicit content policy, none of which are made clear to users what is or isn't allowed. And you can't really blame people for declining to take the time to figure all of this stuff out. Instagram, the photo sharing service that I was discussing earlier, is a little bit more direct in their community guidelines, writing simply, keep your clothes on and be respectful, which seems like pretty good advice for life, but it actually, again, is not making manifestly clear to users what they are or aren't allowed to post on the service. And so like Chelsea Handler, we keep running into instances where content gets removed without it being made clear to us. But more than that, a lot of these rules, including keep your clothes on and be respectful, seem a little bit ridiculous. To quote Tarleton Gillespie, it seems absurd that we have to draw this many lines in this much sand. In this talk, I want to elaborate on that question a little bit. And I want to ask specifically, whose lines are we dealing with and what sand are we talking about? More specifically, what's the domain that we're dealing with here? How do these rules construct an arena within which user-generated content is either permitted to be created or prohibited from existing at all? How does this affect the visibility of certain individuals or groups or practices online? And then how are these rules justified to users? What are the explanations that services do or don't give for why they're allowing certain policies? One of the most frequent explanations that I've encountered in my own work is that Apple is responsible for these policies. The popularity of something like the App Store has made it possible for more and more people to have access to more and more different ways of expressing themselves. But Apple has a series of rules for everything that's permitted on the App Store, and the guidelines that they give to software developers often are pretty unclear. This is a direct quote from Apple's developer guidelines. They tell people, there's stuff that isn't allowed on the App Store, and you'll know it when you see it, but we're not actually going to tell you what it is. And this has become a really frequently cited explanation that I've encountered in my own work. Specifically, when I was interviewing the CEO of the gay-targeted social networking service Grindr, which has a famously restrictive set of content management policies, uh, he said, from day one, we use the App Store guidelines as a framework for development. 
He's locating the burden here solely on Apple rather than on his own interpretations of what Apple wants developers to do. This becomes more concrete when you think about something like Grindr's own policies, which include a famous prohibition on the display of sexually suggestive fruits or vegetables. Now, it's worth recognizing that nowhere in Apple's policies, and I've read them all, do they ban sexually suggestive fruits or vegetables. Grindr interpreted those policies to result in a rule about fruits or vegetables that reflects their own positions rather than anything that was coming from above. And yet they're justifying their behavior as being simply compliance with Apple's rules. We encounter, to paraphrase my favorite Judge Judy, a situation where users speak, services tell them to shut up, and there doesn't seem to be too much recourse. And so in the few minutes I have left, I want to suggest a couple of ways in which things might not be quite so bleak. And specifically, I want to use something as humble as the eggplant emoji to suggest that users are able to make do with these practices in ways that reframes uh, the content we're looking at as perhaps people-generated content. I want to privilege the ability of people to make do with services rather than users who have to simply comply with the rules that they're given. Now, this eggplant, and I alluded to it with Grindr's uh, prohibition on sexually suggestive fruits or vegetables, does indeed resemble a certain male organ. And <laughs> I'll let you uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, there's a certain similarity there. And on Grindr, it turns out that this has had a huge amount of popularity. There's a lot of talk about big eggplants and long eggplants and girthy eggplants and, and so on and so forth. Users have deployed this as a way to get around the service's prohibition on explicit discussions of sexual practice or body parts. That, like the images, isn't allowed. And so the eggplant emoji is a way to discuss that without violating the letter of the law. Users have also used emojis like an up arrow, a down arrow, and VS, and I'm not really clear what that emoji is initially supposed to be, as a way to indicate their preferred sexual position, top, bottom, or versatile. Again, that kind of frank discussion would be grounds for suspension from the service. And yet by encoding those kinds of uh, behaviors in emoji, users are able to create a space in which they can communicate what's important to them without running afoul of the letter of the law on the service. This last example I think is especially interesting. It's a plus sign in brackets. While disclosing one's zero status isn't a violation of the service's content policies or terms of service, there isn't a feature available in the Grindr interface for making that kind of disclosure. Instead, users use the plus sign in brackets as a way to share whether they are HIV positive on their profile because they want to find a way to communicate that information in spite of limitations in the Grindr application itself. <coughs> Each of these examples is what I want to term tentatively a form of expressive resistance, a way that users find a space for themselves within the confines of services and use seemingly mundane everyday tools like emoji as a way to uh, share information that's meaningful to them. It becomes a way of creating, I repeat, people-generated content, things that are relevant to users themselves, important to users, and that don't necessarily line up with the letter of the law on these services. I want to keep things moving on this interesting panel, but this work is going to be out early next year in Communication, Culture, and Critique, or I'm happy to share a copy of the paper with you early now. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm looking forward to answering any questions that you might have in the Q&A. Thanks. And our final talk is by Deb Lee, exploring the count. Oh, it's not Katarina. Oh, did I? <laughs> Katarina's up there. I don't know what happened. Sorry, Katarina. You Katarina. It doesn't matter. No, well, let's do Katarina. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she was ahead. Uh, hashtag save the surprise, the making of a mass secret. Sorry. So uh, in keeping with the healthy topic of fruits, vegetables, um, so on and so forth, I'm going to move more onto an exercise context. But before that, I want to say a big thanks to um, Professor Crady, Marina, um, Professor Toro for helping, supporting this event, and then also for all the, all the panelists as well. So thank you, guys. All right, 
So what I want to present to you today is a case of a remarkably well-engineered um, user-generated content campaign. It's called Save the Surprise. And the question that I want to ask, and hopefully um, the question that I want to provide some answers to as well, is why did this work? So let's begin with a story. With three weeks to go until the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games in London 2012, details about the ceremony, about the event, had already begun to leak to the press. Now, as you can imagine, the organizers were not too happy about this because secrets about their $45 million event had started to come out. So they were faced with the pressing challenge of how to keep the rest of the information about the event a secret. They um, had a little bit of a complication, and the complication was the two live dress rehearsals that were coming up. And for these live dress rehearsals, they had audiences of over 100,000 spectators who were going to see this information. To complicate things even further, um, the organizers of the Olympics wanted to channel the image of being the first true social media games. So what did they do? They engineered the event called Save the Surprise, which was essentially a Twitter hashtag, and it encouraged users to generate some kind of content about what they were seeing during the dress rehearsals, but to do so in a way that kept the details a secret. So the way that this happened on a practical level was that the director of the opening ceremony, Danny Boyle, who you're probably more familiar with in film context as opposed to the Olympic context, he came out and he addressed the live dress rehearsal audiences and he said, guys, you're lucky to be here and we thank you so much for your participation, for your help, but please keep what you are seeing a surprise. Don't spoil it for the people who have yet to see it in a week's time. Don't spoil it for the rest of the world, essentially. Um, this message was reinforced through the presenters throughout both live dress rehearsals, and eventually it was assimilated from the audiences too, and it was reinforced in ways of self-policing and policing others' content too. In some, the campaign worked very, very well, and over 45,000 people ended up tweeting using the hashtag Save the Surprise and having some kind of uh, creative content like this, which kind of showed a little bit of information, but nothing that gave away the information. It became a trending topic in uh, Twitter, and it also generated buzz about the event. So basically, it could not have worked better than the way that it ended up working for the organizers. The question we want to ask is, why on earth did it work, right? So I want to propose three layers for why it worked, and the layer that is particularly fitting for this topic is the user network layer. This is where I argue the user-generated <coughs> content really lies and where we can pull some information about that. But before we do that, let me tell you really briefly how I obtained the information for this and then go through these three fundamental layers of how the campaign managed to work so well. So essentially the content for this presentation comes from a broader project of mine which is looking at the Olympics as a platform for innovation. And by innovation, I mean both social and technical innovation. And the data was obtained through um, multimedia content analyses, Twitter analyses, policy documents, and some personal observations too. So here are the three layers that were really the fundamental layers for making this work. The first one is the legal organizational. And what I mean by that is the bare bones of the architecture of this campaign. Without the legal organizational layer, the rest would not have happened. And this layer, refers to the idea that the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, had deals with Twitter, with YouTube, to make this event happen. As far as I'm aware, no content was taken down by Twitter. However, there were two instances where some video content was prematurely posted on YouTube, and YouTube complied with the IOC and took down this content. Interestingly enough, the audience members themselves ended up posting a lot of very critical comments to the people who put up these two videos. So there was this element of it too. With the legal organizational layer, there were also non-disclosure agreements that every employee for the Olympic Games had to sign. So this is the very base level that allowed the rest of the campaign to succeed. The technical layer, very briefly, refers to Twitter itself and the hashtag, which served as a virtual um, water cooler, a cohesive point, if you like, and allowed this campaign to happen virtually. It also refers to this idea of um, both social media organizations and the IOC being able to monitor what's going on. 
um, the hashtag became an aggregator point where the information could be used both for advertisement but also for copyright infringement purposes. And finally, we're getting there. The user network, Claire, referred to actually the participants, those 45,000 people who did tweet and their imagined audiences and real audiences. It's worth noting here that these people are not random people. They were not taken off the street. They were given free tickets and free access to both uh, live dress rehearsals. And they were selected on a basis of having somehow participated in sport or advanced sport in the country during the past few years. So these people from the get-go had some kind of an investment in making this event happen. But still, this alone does not explain why it works so well. So let's dig a little bit deeper and let's explore why the user-generated content actually happened the way the IOC wanted it to happen. So we can draw from media events literature to understand a little bit about the ritualistic um, and euphoric feelings that people get from participating in events or in campaigns like this. However, media events literature tends to stop in the 20th century and does not really address active audiences, user-generated content, or hypermedia events. Um, we can also turn in that case to user-generated content literature. And on the one hand, we have the likes of Andreevich who say, you know, all user-generated content can be um, resembled to exploitation, period. On the other hand, you have someone like Jenkins and the likes who says, you know, all user-generated content is empowering and fun, exclamation mark. But you don't really have something in the middle. You don't have, um, as of yet, some more nuanced way to evaluate these practices. So this is where I argue that we can pull perhaps a little bit from a multi-stakeholder approach literature, um, a little bit from knowledge content management literature to come up with an explanation that enriches our understanding of user-generated content, particularly from the organizational point of view, and at the same time sheds light on why this case worked. So I argue that ultimately the case worked because some value was generated. And it was generated in two ways. One was uh, economic and exchange value. Basically, you're given free tickets to go to this event. And those were worth up to, uh, actually, in some cases, over $3,000. So you have that. You also have this kind of bragging rights, exchange and economic value, right? You're there. You're able to see something that the rest of the world is not able to see. And that's worth something. But then you have this thing that I term the moral value. And that can be divided into three categories. You have this idea of fairness, of the fact that, okay, you were fortunate to be here and to see this, but please be fair to the people who have yet another week to see it. Don't spoil it for them. The moral value can be seen in a sense of nationalism in this case, too. And as we all know, sporting contexts, particularly the Olympics, tend to bring that out in us. And it tends to work very well for the Brits as well. So the message there was, look, um, we are proud to be British. We want to make the best show that we can put on. And the third one, which is not to be underestimated, is this idea of playfulness. There's something to be said about, look, I'm here, I have this information, I'm going to tease you a little bit with it. And that's a moral value too. <coughs> so in conclusion, the campaign works so well because it engaged audiences as multi-stakeholders in the co-construction of an event and engineered user-generated content as a process of knowledge creation and knowledge management and here, I just want to add two very quick clauses with the 30 seconds that I have left before Professor Turo stands up again. And these clauses are, talking about value does not say that the audiences and the organizations are equal. It does not diminish the power dynamics. However, it does, especially in this case, argue that value was obtained from both sides. And again, talking about value allows us to take a more nuanced view of why it is that user-generated content works and why organizations and audiences want to engage in it. This is a step away from the dichotomy of empowering, disempowering, and it allows us both as audience members, as academics, as um, practitioners, to get another layer of depth and a little bit more color to the practice. So I leave you with that, and thank you for your attention. But not least, yeah. <laughs> that we'll be exploring the counter narratives of innovation within the maker movement. All right. So I just want to preface this by saying that this is like very new work for me. It's 
coming from my dissertation and I haven't really talked about it in public. So, so I actually welcome not only your questions, but feedback on like maybe how I continue thinking about these particular issues. So my um, dissertation is really looking at um, on the ground practices of people who are involved in maker activities and educational spaces. Um, and the, the kind of things I want to ask today are about thinking about the ways in which the idea of the maker movement has been um, shaped by certain kinds of assumptions and how that can lead us to different kinds of ways of understanding what's happening on the ground. So just to give everyone a little bit of feedback, because I know a lot of people don't really know what this is, um, the maker movement is a mainstream term to describe sort of like the current iteration of the do-it-yourself movement that incorporates technology. One of the sort of like touchstone objects of the movement is a 3D, a 3D printer. So like whenever people ask me about the maker movement, I always say 3D printing, and everyone suddenly knows what I'm talking about. But it also <laughs> includes other kinds of consumer electronics that were like prototyping electronics, including things like microcontrollers, like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, um, laser cutters, and other sort of large scale previously large-scale manufacturing equipment that is now available um, at the consumer level. And much of the activity, even though it's named the maker movement, a lot of this early activity came out of spaces that are called like maker spaces, alternatively called hacker spaces. The distinction between those is something I can't really go into right now. <laughs> it's very complicated and Kevin knows all about it. But essentially what they are are communal spaces in which people have access to a lot of these types of technologies and they can work together as like knowledge communities and training each other and making things. So there is an underground aspect of this that's more involved in the hacker community, but the more mainstream element of it has come out through sort of the popular press, I'd like to argue, and sort of um, the development of Make Magazine, if you've heard of that. It's run by Maker Media, and it used to be underneath O'Reilly te Technology Publishers in Silicon Valley. And so they have really promoted the idea of making as this like, very mainstream thing that everyone can sort of glom onto. And um, one of the, I think another one of the touchstone publications of the, the movement is Chris Anderson, who's the <coughs> former editor of, of Wired's book on making and how it's going to transform American um, and global economic life. Um, and they also, make, make move, Maker Media, who runs Make Magazine, also has a lot of other properties, including Maker Fairs, which are like humongous, what they call show and tells of Maker activity that attract like tens of thousands of people. They have two major events in the Bay Area in New York. And then there's been like a network of other sort of smaller mini maker fairs throughout not only the, the country, but like elsewhere. Like there's a maker for Africa, there's places, there's maker for China, Australia, et cetera. So that's the, the maker movement. So the thing that I'm trying to look at specifically in my dissertation is the iteration of it within educational spaces. Um, and this is a sort of more like fun, softer side of making that um, is, has been taken up by educational institutions, including schools, um, especially museums, libraries have been buying lots of 3D printers and s creating these maker spaces within. And um, there's lots of sort of official organizations that focus on this, including the Maker Education Initiative and Maker Camp, which come from that O'Reilly maker media situation, as well as other independent organizations like DIY.org um, and like Instructables has partnered with this education. This, so the academic community has also been really interested in studying, the education academic community has been interested in studying it, and so then they have sort of also partnered with a number of these groups, including the Make to Learn Initiative, which is a bunch of academic researchers working with instructables.org. Is that org? Yeah, anyways. So the, the landscape is kind of wide, but even though it seems kind of niche, um, it's actually attracted a lot of wider attention beyond that. So um, the Obama administration has been very um, active in promoting the maker movement in general as an economic, as an economic incentive, I guess. Or and so you can see right here, like Obama has spoken at Tech Shop, which is a maker movement franchise. Sorry, a maker space franchise that started in California, and he's sort of spoken about not only the importance of the maker movement in promoting sort of our economic future, but also in terms of the the future of the children. There was like a very famous moment when a bunch of like maker kids came to the White House. And so that, uh, that picture on the top right is like, it's like a, mar it's a marshmallow catapult and like <laughs> many people within the, like the, the maker education movement have like talked about that particular moment as being so great. There was a moment when there was recognition from the president and this past year there was a maker fair, the first ever maker fair at the White House. And I think this quote really represents very much like how the administration is thinking about making in terms of kids and both economics. So I want to all read it. Um, I want us all to think about new and creative ways to engage young people in science and engineering. Whether it's science festivals, robotics competitions, fairs that encourage young people to create and build an event, 
to be makers of things and not just consumers of things. And sort of like this, is that two minutes? No, oh, okay. No. Um, and so then this last sort of like, I have a lot to say. So anyways, <laughs> yes, that is like a big sentiment, which I'll talk about. So I want to sort of think about how the particular assumptions behind this support actually like lead us to particular ways of thinking about what's happening on the ground that might be contradictory. Um, so a big aspect of how maker education is being framed is, is, is within the larger framework of STEM education. And for those of you who don't know what STEM education is, I'm sure you most know, um, it stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics Education. And it's mostly sort of invoked within policy context to describe state support of this type of education. This is not a new thing, even though Obama and has talked about it now, a lot of this sort of state support of this type of education began in the 1950s during the Cold War, especially with the space race. There was fears about the American educational system failing vis-a-vis -vis, um, like Soviet education system. And the National Defense Education Act passed in 1957 in response to the launching of Sputnik. Um, and sort of the, the general like, um, support of science education in higher education also like went throughout the years, like large defense um, contracts with, um, with, with, with universities and other kinds of scientific um, support in that arena. And then in the 80s, there was kind of a resurgence of this like K to 12 interest with like the rise of the Japanese consumer electronics market and fears about like falling behind in global competition. And a very famous report called A Nation at Risk was commissioned by um, Reagan um, and really talked about like the supposed fail failures of the American education system keeping up with the rest of the world. And that really brought about like currently in education policy circles like the standards and accountability trend and like what you would know that as is sort of like this high stakes testing um, sort of environment which many people have sort of spoken about as being very detrimental to the state of American education in general. And so No Child Left Behind in 2001 <laughs> under Bush has also been sort of like invoked under that same sort of like umbrella of things that have really destroyed um, American education. So within this history, ma the maker education has come right at the moment when they want to transform this like high stakes testing environment into a more friendly sort of like hands on situation that moves away from testing. So in some ways it's posed counter to this movement, but it also falls within it because I would say that primarily the justifications for supporting educational making fall underneath two major camps. First, the economic benefits, which falls underneath this like STEM category. Like, you know, we have to promote, like Obama has spoken about this, we have to promote, we have to promote making because it promotes STEM jobs and it will allow people to go more into STEM careers and that will help, the, like that will help us be competitive in the global market and, you know, create more opportunities at home. Um, but also, in addition to this, there's another kind of promotion of a certain kind of like neoliberal individualism. So Dale Doherty, who's the founder of Make Magazine, has spoken about how making is like just an expression of a human need to create. But this is sort of forayed into other more like loose affiliations of making with like political empowerment, you know, this producer rather than consumer stuff, um, and has like sort of like kind of towed the line of not only like um, self-sufficiency, which is like a, another ideal that's being expressed here in terms of like getting a better job for oneself, but that you can be self-sufficient and you can sort of live independently of other people as long as you're really good at technology. So this is this techno-utopian sort of ideal that's promoted within this maker movement, which makes a lot of sense because it comes out of Silicon Valley and like that's where, if you know, for those of us who are interest, interested or know about Fred Turner's work, he speaks about this ideal and how it sort of came up through the ranks there. So. How does this, and this is my last slide, so I don't know how many minutes I have. I'm giving you time. Oh. <laughs> so, so, so like my dissertation is really focused on sort of like things that happen on the ground underneath this banner. And the, the questions that come up to me when I look at the, the sort of rhetoric that's being promoted is like these general four categories. So please give me feedback if you want to. I want to know what people think. Um, first of all, the funding structures of a lot of these organizations sort of fall underneath this like rhetoric I said of like STEM education. And what that does is it kind of co-ops a lot of existing programs that may not have been under like, underneath this sort of banner of STEM and economic growth or self-sufficiency um, because people want to get money. DARPA has actually funded a number of makerspace um, programs. Um, the maker education, like, well, there's a lot that I can list, but like, and a good example of this is like within libraries there, 10 years ago, there was like 
a lot of funding that went into these things called digital learning labs. And a lot of them at the time really focused on sto digital storytelling and enacting the particular voices of students and giving the pe people platforms to really talk about issues that they care about. But a lot of these learning labs have now been converted into maker spaces. And the conversation about like speaking out about issues that are of interest to you have been co-opted by, oh, learn how to become self-sufficient by learning technology and all that other stuff about engaging with certain issues has gone away because they want to get money, you know. Um, so, and, it, and I think that sort of this leads to what Mazarov has called technological solutionism, thinking that in some ways, and this was discussed last week during this symposium, media activism symposium as well, but like, just because people are becoming more self-sufficient and getting technological skills doesn't necessarily, you can't really equate that to some kind of um, empowerment, but that's the kind of like, language that's being thrown around when people are trying to apply for funding for this kind of stuff. And this also brings us to this idea of um, how people critique the maker movement primarily as a middle class phenomenon. It's primarily male, it's primarily white. Um, and Mike Rose is an education scholar who has spoken about how like, a lot of the things that are being promoted underneath maker education, like learning how to, co like learn, not code, but learning how to like, do circuitry and carpentry and like, hands-on tangible you know, making is very similar to vocational education. And a lot of the things that are being promoted there are things that people within, in, in working classes that have been doing all their lives to sort of get jobs to succeed because they can't buy new stuff. And so to call it something different as if it's so novel is sort of to detract from the ways in which these things have already been promoted for a long time for people of a different class. And that's sort of getting to the, my larger point that I want to go to in the, the end of my dissertation, which is the role and purpose of education at large. You know? So lots of people consider education as something that promotes equity. Um, but whenever you sort of try to promote, whenever you try to sort of like promote these ideals of individual social mobility, that is directly in contrast to equity because if people are being made to move ahead of other people, some other people will be behind. So there's like this kind of difficult, I think, reckoning that the maker movement has to concern itself with, with is this, an is this a vocational situation where you're trying to get people into high-skilled STEM jobs or is it about sort of like this softer idea of empowerment? And I guess I'm still trying to wrestle with this, and I see all these faces like quizzically thinking about it. So, yes, please give me comments about this later. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. So, we have time for uh, questions, answers, comments. Uh, can I ask a question? Because I think it's, since I'm staying up here, I'm. I have to go. So oh, so go ahead. You have to go. Yes. Um, so, two things. Um, is it Karen? Deb. Deb, sorry. Um, I would encourage you, I mean, I'm, it's fascinating, and I would encourage you when you're thinking about the class issue and its connection to existing educational programs, that to me it sounds very much less like vocational, uh, conventional vocational schooling which really is directed towards kids who are whatever, not performing at the level of the sort of expectations of white middle class or, or you know, within, within um, sort of scholastic criteria, it sounds to me much more like the kind of, in fact, the opposite of that, which is the gifted in education, which is the shadow of public education in a lot of states, certainly in California, where a lot of this is originating, that this is a lot like very elite, you know, kids who are identified as gifted and talented and they move into these other streams within, within public education in order to get very customized DIY, you're the, you're the boss, you determine the curriculum, and this is a very elite, you know, th these are very, for the most part, upper middle class kids, white and Asian in California. So, you know, there might be these elements of vocational stuff, but within the neoliberal context that you're talking about, I really think there's this other, from what you've said, from what I could believe from what you said, stronger impulse, which is towards the opposite direction on the class spectrum. Um, and then the, my question for Kevin is, is how you feel like you might situate your, your work within a kind of tradition of like Steve Epstein with in pure science and is it just, is what you're seeing part of that agenda only in the digital, you know, only gone digital? Or do you see it as really some, something fundamentally different in terms, especially in terms of like pressing against the medical establishment or sort of creating new spaces of, of user generated content in terms of um, pushing back against mainstream mm -hmm. institutions. And then, it, why do I want to say Karen? 
Katarina. Katarina, sorry. <laughs> User-generated content is an interesting concept. Part of what I feel like your presentation is doing is, 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 is breaking that apart a little bit because these folks who are there at these live, you know, the, basically the trailers for the, for, for the Olympics are not just average users like you pointed out. They're hand-selected. They're like the studio audience of, you know, the, the Colbert Report at some level, or some, some section of that, right, where people are really invited to participate because they have an investment. And so that's a different kind of user. And it, it really does speak to this um, layer of, uh, of participation in cultural sociology that would be attached to people like mavens or brokers or middlemen, middle women, <laughs> middle people, right? Um, so that might be a, a way to sort of talk about how the user thing gets stratified um, in that language of brokerage. Thank you. So, sorry, I don't have comments for the <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question sort of related to, uh, first to Kevin, and maybe it's related to what you said. Um, I was thinking of Timothy Leary, and I wonder if you've thought about the rhetoric of Timothy Leary and his circle in connection to the kinds of things you've been discussing. Could you give us a prophecy on Timothy Leary? Well, the idea that hallucinogenics mm. was oh, right. a solution yeah, yeah, yeah. To, uh, to people's problems yeah. uh, used properly. Yeah, so let me just respond to Professor Grenstaff real quick just to say, um, I guess your question is kind of like, how does this phenomenon of TDCS like tessellate or whatever with other, like, you know, other kinds of communities that have been studied by, let's say, Steve Epstein? And I feel like, yeah, I don't have this developed at all, and maybe this is a goal I should set up for my dissertation, but I feel like there is a retooling of other kinds of communities at the particular intersection of media studies and science and technology studies. So, you know, Epstein is writing at like STS and sexuality studies or the sociology of knowledge, that kind of thing. And I feel like that juncture of like uh, media studies and STS is, is kind of vacant or whatever. Like there's a lot of people doing it, but I feel like it has the, you know, so, so there, I guess I do, I don't have it figured out, but I do want to say that there is something unique about, let's say, these YouTubers. I just don't have it ready yet. But thank you. That's really, that's helpful. And then, yeah, so then the Timothy Leary stuff, like the, um, uh, like this is a particular moment that in this this text that I mentioned, uh, Beatrice Preciado's Testo Junkie, is um, like contextualized and is like a it, it's put in there like that's part of the and there's like periods um, the development of hormones particularly using low income uh, people of color in um, low income housing developments in Puerto Rico. The, these women were like, as a captive audience, were used as the development for as test subjects for the development of the pill, um, and that's like hormonal research, LSD use, like in the what is it, sixties and seventies, right? In psychedelia, psychedemia, uh, that was also another moment. And then this other, this other one that I'm really interested in is Freud and Benjamin's cocaine addictions. So in this text that I'm really inspired by, Preciado does kind of thematize these, the development of synthetic sex hormones like LSD use and hallucinogenics as a, um, not just an escape, but actually like a, a, a similar rhetoric to what we see here that we're actually using untapped cognitive resources. So yeah, I guess I want to try and figure uh, TDCS YouTubers into this these, I don't know if it's like a moment, like, you know, LSD was or whatever in the academy, but I do feel like it, it falls in a lineage like that. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate all of you. Uh, this is a very fascinating, fascinating topic, very good presentations, everyone. Um, I have a question for you all. I hope you're not going to take this frivolously. I'm very curious, aside from uh, eggplants, what are the vegetables and fruits of this? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the the policy as it was articulated when Grindr posted it on their website was no sexually suggestive fruits or vegetables. And it was part of a clause that became the title of my paper, which was no overly suggestive images of any kind. And they actually left it intentionally vague, right? They Those rules came out before actually emoji went mainstream um, in the most recent releases of Apple's iOS. And there's sort of a technical history to when people started adopting this kind of stuff popularly. But that rule always stood out and, in fact, has been pretty widely lampooned on blogs by Kathy Griffin, by all sorts of folks who have recognized it as this sort of absurd and yet somehow important touchstone of what content management has meant. 
Um, and so, like, one can easily imagine a whole, like, buffet spread of other sexually suggestive vegetables, right? There's, like, zucchinis and so on. But um, but the eggplant emoji has had particular valence for, uh, I think, obvious reasons. Deb, as you were talking, I wish we had talked earlier, or I wish I had remembered to tell you this earlier. So in Eastern Europe, and I only talk because you brought the Cold War rhetoric, there were actually classes I had to take four years in middle school and it's mandatory and it still remained across all the you know former countries where you have a class called basic technological education and what you do for those four years is you're really building circuits you're learning about different woods you're making like I don't know chairs and tools it's very fascinating and very you know not with any you know gender dynamics now what's interesting is how that remained to be on the kind of low tech aspects. I mean, you know, basic electronics and so forth. They're trying to do the, what is it, the blueberry and the coding now these days. I don't know how successful, but what was, you know, that was, even then it wasn't about vocational training. It was much more around this idea of, you know, building generations that will be interested in science and technology. What you're talking about, I think what you're mentioning, but you didn't maybe, have yet articulated, which echoes Laura's talk, is like the rise of entrepreneurial culture in the US and uh, the almost like fetishization of startups, that that's what we want to do, that's where we are going. So in that sense, it's very much this privilege because, you know, when you're talking about, I'm thinking of, oh, these kids would like to go to MIT, you know, these kids might want to go to Stanford, I'm not. So even as you're talking, there, there is, there's particular cultural I guess symbols that's come to mind. Yeah, I have a whole section on my, in my proposal about entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial yeah. impulses of this that come out exactly what you're talking about. Like the, I didn't talk about it, but the Anderson book is like entirely about self determination vis a vis entrepreneurial aspirations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like very much sold. And you and I are working on that charter school that the whole, like that, I don't know if they focus on technology, but there's like another charter that focuses on technology, that their whole entire thing is wrapped up in technological entrepreneurialism. Like that's something that like they found entire charter schools mm -hmm. on. So I mean, it's like very known. Okay, sorry, yeah. Yeah, but there's also the design charter school in Philadelphia, right? Yeah. Where all the lessons are taught through design and so forth. So, you know, you there's a maker. There's even, a maker even when you're presenting this, like you really need to make that case strong because I think those are some of the <laughs> assumptions that are packed with him this, but fascinating everybody. I guess you're in the hot seat this morning, right? <laughs> Me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's up? <laughs> Quick question, because I'm sorry I missed, you know, some of the early presentations, but have you come across uh, the A, I think I've seen it, like STEAM and then STEMI at the end where, they include, where they're including arts and arts as the creative aspect and also in most communities when where the arts go, so goes the direction of the community in terms of the growth. Did you come across any? Yeah, that's like really popular within um education academic communities like all, all every presentation I've gone to has like incorporated a in there and I think that's also an impulse to like most of the most of the curriculum that's loose enough to allow for making and stuff is like art but they have to find a way to make it like important so they've just like suddenly been like oh let's combine a science class with our art class so we can call a maker class um, and it's also like, a, I mean, it's a particular strategy of like incorporating things that, that, that makes it easier to fund. I mean, I, yeah, I, I still have to think about it, but like I've been to so many panels that are like, let's add the A to STEM for STEAM. And they always like talk about like creative expression and learning how to code. It's always like learning how to code. Sorry. I'm just, yeah, sorry, I'm just riffing. Um, a couple, couple things. Um, you all, for your talk, I'm wondering um, if you've looked at any of sort of the new, I can't even remember what they're called, but like the alternative Facebooks and like those sites. Things like LO? Yes, and if they've taken up this issue and how they do that, and if it's like crowdsourced. Um, and then for Deb, I'm wondering, so we had technology classes and computer classes too, like on the island growing up, and I, I forgot, but where we had to make like. Yeah, I had shop class. Yeah, yeah but that's okay, but that's, see that, that, that got like parlayed into vocational. 
right. aspects and then got cut. And then that's why they became like computer education classes. And a lot of them have gotten cut. Some of them have, some of them haven't. But I'm wondering, too, if the focus then is actually on this idea of like in, of sort of branding it as creativity and, and branding it as makerism and yeah, why, kind of, why that's happening. Um, the kind of interesting thing is like, I also, I don't know that much about the history of vocational education, although I just like want to learn about it now, is like, there's been movements, it's so funny, within vocational education to make it more like general curriculum by adding more academic elements too. So there's also been a convergence within that circle. It's just, sorry, I forgot what your original question is, but. Um, well, it's more just a, a, a comment, I guess, but like, it, to me, I would associate the maker stuff with, I mean, because where it comes up in my research is how it relates to like gentrifying cities. Like there'll be a new small city that's, talking where, you know, the Visitors Bureau is talking about how it's a bustling creative class and we have Maker's Fair now too, right? And so it's always in terms of that and never from the educational side of things, so this is interesting. So I guess I'm thinking where those two come, come together, if that discourse of creativity and like, you know, how that's thrown around as sort of the answer to the world's problems and creative people are, is what will, you know, regenerate the economy and how that was used around after the collapse, like how that fits into um, education as well. I, I have no idea. Let's talk about it in the office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, so I think the emergence of, of platforms like Elo are kind of interesting in that they're always framed sort of uto in this sort of utopic sense, right? It's Elo emerged in the midst of the Facebook controversy about uh, drag names being permissible, and Elo framed itself as an alternative to these kinds of draconian restrictions. And yet, almost inevitably, any kind of social platform is going to run into a place where they need to start thinking seriously about user misbehavior, right? So I'm talking about things like boobs and dick pics, but what happens when somebody starts sharing child pornography on your platform, or actually as it's called child sexual exploitation, right? Like what happens when that problem emerges? At that point, as a service provider, you have a legal requirement to start regulating the content that users are sharing on your platform. And so the question is, will you stop at just what is legally required? Do you keep things that are like absolutely not allowed off of your service and end it there? Or does one content restriction lead to another, lead to another, creating this sort of spiral of regulation? We've seen that happen across a bunch of services. It happened on Twitter. It happened on Vine. And for a variety of reasons, a base set of protections that ensure things like compliance with laws have turned into these kind of sweeping sets of rules. Um, my hunch is that it's an inevitable institutional effect. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting to see how platforms like Elo, if they end up catching on and attracting use, or in fact, even if they don't, how they end up having to cope with some of these issues. Can I piggyback on that? Because it's, it's a fascinating topic. But knowing something a little bit, you know, about the history of the, the mainstream gay press, for example, and even the history of, of other media and online media, the more something becomes popular, the more they worry about advertisers, the more advertisers worry about the content of the sites they're putting stuff on. There are, there are uh, distribution, ad distribution companies online that have blacklists of, of sites. And if you're on a blacklist, you're not going to get the money. So not all of what you're talking about, but I think some at least of what you're talking about may have to do with as you aggregate more and more people worrying about being on a blacklist so you won't get the money that the companies are distributing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, if policies like what Apple has for its developers, and actually Google has the same ones, um, if those are restrictive, then the restrictions that ad networks have are even more significant. They have sort of explicit family-friendly provisions that many of these services are subject to. Grindr is kind of a special case in that it isn't. Um, Grindr manages all of its advertising in-house. It doesn't partner with these bigger networks. They set the rules for what goes on the platform. But in many other cases, and there's a bunch of competing apps that are roughly the same, they do have to not just follow Apple's rules, not just obey the law, but also then listen to these ad networks, which add kind of an interesting layer to it. And of course, as you're saying, there's a history, right? There's the evolution of the advocate from being this sort of niche publication to eventually they moved all the racy stuff into what were called the pink pages. And then eventually they got rid of the pink pages altogether. And so I think that there's this interesting tendency, and I map a little of it out in the paper, of 
mainstreaming and then also moving the racy stuff uh, to the back and then eventually getting rid of it altogether. Still can't figure out why. The major curse word on TV is son of a bitch. And I once spoke to the head of NBC's censorship and he couldn't tell me why you can say son of a bitch, but you can't say other words. He thought that son of a bitch could only be said after 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> but apparently that's not true because I've heard it before on NBC. So there's really interesting ambiguities all over the place. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. This is going to be